Turn, turn to Mark chapter 2 for me uh, this morning if you've got a Bible there. Who has a Bible on them? Anyone? Wave your Bible in the air. Just interesting. Yeah, a couple of people still bring Bibles. Who's got it on their phone? Wave your phone in the air. Anyone got a phone? Yep, yep. Uh, who's got a notepad to take notes down or something? Who's relying on their brain, thinks their brain is good enough to capture whatever God might speak to you this morning and that by the time you get out there and your, your car might stall or your, your a cat runs across you or you kick your toe on something, but you won't lose that and drop it and not be able to find it again. I'm, I'm like that. God, God's, God was speaking things to me on the way home uh, in the car from the conference and I kept, I said, kept saying to Jackie, Jackie, get your phone out. I want you to send me a text message and put this in there. And so she's sending me text messages. I, I woke up at three o'clock this morning with thoughts and stuff and I had to wake up and get my, my notepad and start taking down notes at three and then again at four I'm up again and taking down notes as God's just sort of dropping things into my spirit because I've learnt something, I drop them really quickly. If I don't grab them straight away, I drop them really, really quickly. Now you're probably way better than me. You're probably way better than me, so that's okay. I'm just saying this is how I operate. So I encourage you, if God speaks something to you, uh, get your phone out, write it down. Don't lose it. Don't forget it. Don't give it time. You know, uh, uh, Jesus talked about the parable of the sower, and the seed got sown, and birds of the air came, and the worries, and all these things come to snatch it away. So if God speaks to you, write it down somewhere. Put it down somewhere. Just speak into your voice message. I don't know what you do, but just capture it so that you can sit with it, and you can mull it over and wrestle with it with God. Okay, so we went to a conference, as you know, uh, INC conference. Next year, uh, our movement turns 50. Um, 1974, uh, INC began. And um, we were uh, spent a, a bit of time throughout the conference just revisiting the history of INC and going right back to the beginnings of uh, this movement. Um, someone said to me the other day, they had to fill out a form, and you don't want a form, you, they ask you what religion, you tick you know, Presbyterian, Uniting, all that, and they were looking, they couldn't find INC anywhere. And well, that's probably because we're not a denomination, we're a movement. We're a movement of churches, and we're going somewhere, moving forward, and then they eventually found Christian Outreach Centre, which is what we used to be known as, and they, they, they ticked that. But we spent a few days, and, and some of the, the guys that have been around for a long time in the movement were reminding us about the heritage and the history of, of INC and where it came from. And what's really interesting is this. We, you know, we're singing that song, um, uh, We Need a Fresh Wind. We Need a Fresh Wind. And, and, and that song is about, about the Holy Spirit just sort of blowing. And we need that fresh sort of breath and blowing of the Spirit. Um, I, we started talking a, a bit of a series on the Holy Spirit about eight weeks back. And it all started because I was sitting in my lounge room looking. Jackie was talking to me and I was, I was listening, but I was looking up at the corner of the, of the lounge room at a cobweb. Who was here when we started talking about this? There was a little spider web in the corner. And as I'm looking at it, the spider web just started doing this, gently moving. And while Jackie's talking to me, I'm thinking, that's strange. Nobody's walking. There's no fan on. There's no, no door been opened. There's, there's no... How is that little tiny spider web in the corner? There's no spot. How is it moving? And I felt like God said to me back then, that's what I'm doing here. There's this gentle wind of the Holy Spirit that is starting to blow in this place. And then I, I got around and there are people saying to me, you know, I don't know what it is. I just feel hungry to read the word of God. I haven't felt that for a long time. Another one, I just really want to pray. And I, it hasn't been something I've, I used to be passionate about, but now I'm getting passionate about prayer. And, and different stories that people uh, started to share about their relationship with God. I, I, I just want to know God more. I'm just feeling this drawing to the presence of God that, that I haven't felt for a long time. And, and, and that was evidence to me of what God was saying, that there's this gentle sort of move of the Holy Spirit. Well, then we go through uh, all these things that we don't want to do with the Spirit. We don't want to resist. We don't want to grieve. We don't want to quench. And then we moved into the three things we do want to do. We want to be filled and we want to be led. And this week we ended up to land on the, the, the end game of being filled and being led. And that is that we would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Who, 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 who gets excited when they think about the power of God? Yeah. I do. I, I, I came to faith at 19 and it wasn't long before I was in an environment of signs, wonders and miracles. Before I knew what was going on up here. 
I was experiencing something that was way outside my uh, intellectual capacity to grab a hold of. I'm looking at people uh, get delivered of demonic spirits in this big tent where I found myself one day doing a training school at Waiwe and there are people being delivered of demonic spirits over here. I'm seeing people get healed of physical ailments right in front of my eyes. I'm watching people with emotional bondages being broken and, and mental problems being broken right in front of my eyes. And I've got no intellectual capacity to get it but I'm watching it and I'm seeing the fruit of it because I'm living with these people and all of a sudden there's joy coming back to them where there was sorrow there's beauty coming back where there was ashes we sang about that this morning and my brain's going tilt tilt I don't get it but I'm looking going but God this is you this is the stuff you talked about you talked about bringing beauty for ashes Jesus stood up and he said the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news he said he's anointed me to set at liberty those who are captive he's anointed me to preach recovery of sight to the blind he's anointed me to open prison doors and I'm looking around going wow this is what that is that I'm seeing freedom come to people by 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 the the, the power of the Holy Spirit. God is doing things that I can't do. I can't do. One moment, allowing the Holy Spirit to get involved in something, and it seems that God can do in a moment, in a suddenly, what it can take years and years for me to try to work out and try to make happen. I remember sitting uh, as a new believer, sitting with a girl, and, and, and there were th- these, these other two or three leaders at YWAM, and they were way more mature than me, spiritual than me, been with walking with the Lord way longer than me. I was saved for about 10 minutes. And, I, 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 and, and we're praying. And while we're praying, I remember getting a vision where we're praying for this girl, and she's bound up and locked up emotionally. And I've never forgot it, and I've probably shared the story with you before. And I'm, we're praying, and here's little old me, and I see a picture of a red tricycle with three wheels. You know, just weird, just random. I don't see lots of pictures of tricycles. It's not what I think about. But this tricycle pops in my head, you know. And I just had this weird feeling. You've got to say this. You've got to speak this out. And I'm sitting there thinking, I want to speak this out. These other spiritual giants are going to think you're an idiot. You're seeing pictures of tricycles, you know. Go back and whatever. But in the moment, I remember saying, you know what, I, I, and they've been praying and binding and casting and all kinds of things. And I remember saying, I know this is going to sound weird, but I, I just feel like I'm seeing a picture of a little red tricycle. And the minute I said that, bang, this woman just burst into uncontrollable sobbing and tears. And then she began to unpack and tell this story that her father left when she was a little girl. And the last thing he did is get out of the car, walk up to the front of the house and put a little red tricycle down. And then turned around and walked away and she didn't see him again. I didn't know that, but God knew that. It was a moment where the Holy Spirit invaded, heaven invaded earth, and God did something on the back of that. It didn't make any intellectual sense to me. And, and as we were there this week and they were talking about the birthing of this movement, which used to be Christian Outreach Centre, and they went back and the thing that stood out to me was this movement was birthed by a, a, a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. Steve and Margie see up the back. You guys, uh, I know, have been involved in uh, Christian Outreach Centre and were a part of a lot of that stuff. So I'm sure you probably remember what some might say, the good old days, whatever. But, but the Holy Spirit w- was the foundation of this movement. A- and there were healings and miracles and signs and wonders and the power of God to set people free. Not, 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 not to build a movement. I don't think God did that to build a movement. But, but, but here's what happens. In Mark chapter 2. Go to Mark chapter 2. I want to read something to you. In Mark chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, I was sitting down on, uh, what's today? Sunday, it wasn't Saturday, Friday, Thursday. I was sitting down Thursday morning. We got up Thursday morning, and I'm having a bit of time with the Lord, and I'm sitting on my bed, and I open up my Bible, and this is what I turn to. Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 2. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Uh, whoever did the New King James, they had no idea how cool they were going to be one day, hey, writing it that way. And they heard he was in the house. That just sounds really funky and cool. I'm sure they didn't mean it to, but nowadays that just sounds cool. He was in the house. Drop the mic right there. And Jesus was in the house, and immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. It says, and again he entered Capernaum. So he'd already been there. And if you go back to chapter 1, here's what happens in chapter 1. Jesus is filled with the Spirit. Then he is led by the Spirit into the temptation narrative. And we see that happen. Then he calls some disciples, come follow me. Then he goes to Capernaum and he taught with authority. And people recognize, they go, who is this man with authority? He's speaking. The Pharisees are gobsmacked. They can't, they've got no comebacks. 
This guy knows this, these ancient documents way better than they do, and, and, and they're just going, uh, 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 we got nothing. He's got wisdom and authority that he preaches with. And then he casts out a demon. And then he, start, then he goes and heals Simon's mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law. Any mother-in-laws here today? Yep, be healed in Jesus' name. And, and, and he comes and he heals Peter's mother-in-law. And then after that word gets out and it says that he continued, the crowds came and he continued all through the evening healing and casting out demons and setting people free. And then the next morning when he wakes up, of course, Jesus gets up early then everybody else goes up to a mountain to pray. And the crowds gather and the disciples are running around trying to find him. Eventually Jesus comes down. They say, great, you're here. Let's go and pray. Jesus says, no, there are other places where I need to go and preach. So he leaves Capernaum. And then in Mark chapter 2, he comes back. And what happens when he comes back? It says that when they heard he was in the house, they gathered. It's just something exciting about knowing God is in the house. Just something exciting about knowing that the power and the presence of God is real and active and it's there. It's there. It's accessible for us. When people heard that he'd come back, that his presence and his power was in the house, people came running to him. See, people were drawn to the presence and the power of Jesus. And we see that all throughout the gospel stories. The hurting were drawn to him. The broken were drawn to him. The bound were drawn to his power and presence. The blind, the wretched, but not so the religious. The religious, for some reason, are kind of on the outer a little bit here. They didn't quite know how to take him, and they didn't quite dive in to all the things that Jesus had to offer. Now, here's the thing. While I'm reading this passage, sitting on my bed, I get a phone call. And so I pick up my phone. I had really poor reception in Nooseville, where we were staying in this Airbnb place. So I said, hang on, I'll, I'll go outside. I went outside, and I just get this random conversation this guy goes look you you don't you don't know me but i found you and i found your number because a friend of mine who lives in the central grampians in victoria joins you guys on a sunday and watches you guys on church so if you're watching today never met you but hello he said a friend of mine uh watches you guys he stumbled across you one day and now he, he joins you guys online from central victoria and he said, I'm about to do a charity bike ride. So I, I travel right up and down the East Coast and I raise money for different charities. And I'm just, uh, he, he told me just to give you a call because I'm coming through Lismore next year on my bike ride. So I just thought I'd ring and say hello and introduce myself. And, and if I'm there on a Sunday, I'll, I'll pop into your church. That's great. And then he begins to tell me this story. He begins to tell me about the place where he's from. And he says, you know, he, he says something really weird is happening. He says, in our community, in our town, he says, this, he, he mentioned a particular church. He goes, this church has shut down. They've decided to close. And so they've closed their doors in this community. And they said, this other church, on the other said they've decided to do the same thing. They've shut their doors and closed down their community and their building. And there's another church about to have a meeting. And they're thinking about pulling out of town as well. And he starts telling me stories of all these churches that are closing their doors and pulling out of town. Now, I asked him a question. He went on for a bit and I said, in your opinion, I'm not there, in your opinion, why do you think that these churches are closing their doors? Why do you think that, that people aren't coming? Why do you think that it's getting to that place where they're pulling out of town? And he said this to me. He said, well, in my opinion, he said, there's no presence of the Holy Spirit. There's no power of God. And I finished my conversation with him, went back in, and I went back to Mark chapter 2, and I thought, wow, here's the reality. People will come to a house when the presence and power of God are in it, but they'll leave when it's not. They'll leave when it's not. They'll go. If it's just religion, uh, people will only hang around religion for so long. People are broken. People are hurting. And the world doesn't have answers. And the truth of the matter is, the church doesn't always have answers either, but Jesus does. The power of the Holy Spirit does. God has answers and solutions and God can do for people in a moment. What it can take us years and years to try to do, God can do like that. Now I'm not, listen to me clearly, I'm not saying he's doing, he will do it all the time like that. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is he can. It's possible. It's possible. It's possible. First Peter 2 verse 4 to 5 says this. This is Peter speaking about the house. You see, when, we, when, when I say that, that, that people are drawn to a house where the presence and power of God is, I want you to not think of a building. I want you to think of yourself because you are the house of God. Amen? Do you know that? In the new covenant, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you, resident in you. And Peter writes this to a group of people that were suffering persecution. He says, coming to him as a living stone. He says, rejected indeed by men, 
but chosen by God and precious. He's speaking about you. He's speaking about the believer, saying, saying, saying that we come to him as a living, a living stone. Uh, we're rejected indeed by men, but we're chosen by God. We're, we might be rejected by men because of our faith, but we're chosen by God. We might be rejected by men because of our stance on certain things, but we're chosen by God. We might end up rejected uh, by, by, by men because we actually have the audacity to actually believe what these ancient documents talk about. We may be rejected by society, community. We may face rejection at school, rejection in the workplace. But he says even though we're going to be rejected by men, if we're a living stone that he's building together, we'll be rejected by men. But if we stand firm on what we believe, he says you've got to understand this, you're chosen by God. You've been chosen by God. And then he says this, you also as living stones, each individual here also as living stones, is you are being built up to a spiritual house. You are being built together. Each one of us have the spirit within us, but God's not leaving us as individual lampstands. He's actually knitting us all together, joining us together so that we become the church. That's why we don't have the word church on our building. I don't want people to keep thinking that, 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 oh, is that building a church? No, the building's just a building where the church gathers. The building's just a building. It's concrete, it's steel, but you are the church. I am the church. And the power and the presence of God doesn't live in the building. It lives in the house. You and me, the ones that God is knitting together. See, the purpose of the Holy Spirit's presence in my life is not just to make me a good person so I can build my social collateral out there in the world. I hope that happens, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is that I would be a vessel through which the Spirit can flow in order to bring glory to the one who can save and heal. That The Spirit wants to move through me to bring glory to God. Not just, you know, look, Christians are nice people, aren't we? Hands up if you're a nice person. Yeah, I mean, isn't that what people think of you? I remember when I came to faith and my nana, who knew my background and the messed up stuff I was brought up in, I remember when I came to Jesus and she heard about it and she said to me, oh, that's so good for a person like you. That's just so good, so good. Nan, do you understand the rejection I'm going to cop? Do you understand that people don't like it? And she had no idea. That's just so nice. People like you needed that. She says, like, people like you really need that. Everybody needs that. Everybody needs faith in Jesus. Everybody's going to stand before God one day and give an account of their life. Everybody is facing one of two uh, uh, future destinations and without going into the ins and outs of what does heaven mean and what does hell mean, I know this. One is eternity with God. One is eternally separated from God. What they look like and I want to banter back and forth about, but one's definitely better than the other. And I was created for one and not the other. Amen? Amen. We all need Jesus. We all need faith in God. We all need to have the gospel explained to us. We all need to experience the reality of the presence of God, not just biblical theories, not just theories about who he is. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, back in the early 1900s, I don't know whether he... You're going to put that up on the screen for me? I don't know whether William Booth... I don't know whether he stood up and said to a group of people, I'm going to prophesy something, or whether he just said something that, in my opinion, has turned out to be so incredibly prophetic. But here's what William Booth said. He said, The chief danger of the 20th century will be religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. I look at that statement and I go, that is a prophecy. And I believe that we are walking and living in parts of that right now. And I can see that happening in the world around me. Heaven without hell. I don't know, I, I, I don't mean this disrespectfully and, and, and please hear my heart, but I've never been ever to a funeral where I heard somebody go and that person is probably, potentially, most likely separated from it. Now they always go and they're in heaven now. Everybody's in heaven. doesn't matter whether you, whether you know Jesus or not. Everybody's in heaven. Now, I, 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 I know it up to your very last breath. You can come to faith. My grandfather, while he's sitting in the hospital in Lismore Base a few years ago, healing guy, was a drunken and alcoholic, turned his life around but wasn't walking with Jesus. While he, he had a near-death experience, I think I was the only one he ever told about that when he heard I was a Christian. He said, I don't get this, but I died. I saw a light. I walked towards it, and a voice said, you're not ready yet. Go back. Go back. And on his deathbed while he's in the hospital, I'd been in there chatting with him. I left. My uncles went in there who were his sons. And, he st- and my uncle told me after he came out of there when my pop died, he said, the weirdest thing just happened. All of a sudden, 
he just, Lionel looked past us, pointed up and said, there he is. He said, my uncles who are not believers said, we're looking around going, there, who is? It's us, Dad. It's your sons. He said, no, that's him. And they're looking around going, Dad, there's nobody here. It must be the drugs. He said, no, I can see him. They said, who is it? He said, it's Jesus. I can see Jesus. He's walking towards me. Jesus is coming to me. And I believe right up until that last breath that Jesus in his grace and his mercy can reach out to anybody. And so I don't dare judge who's there and who's there. But the point I'm saying is we've got right now a world full of heaven and we don't want to talk about hell. Politics without God. Do I need to go any further? Politics without God. Welcome to Australia. Salvation without regeneration. You can be born again and get your fire insurance, but you do not have to change. You can just be the same person. It doesn't matter about going on with God. We can read in these ancient documents in the letters, add this virtue to that virtue, add to this faith, and then add along. And, and we see a picture of people being transformed and conformed into the image of Jesus, but we have a religion now where we don't really need that. It's just all about grace and come to faith. And you can just keep screwing up, keep making mistakes. You don't have to change because God will just keep forgiving you and keep throwing out freebies to you, get out of jail, free cards. It doesn't matter. But that's not what we read in here. That's not what we read. I'm saved by grace through faith, but I don't grow by grace. I've got to put a little bit of work into that. I've got to pick up my Bible, and sometimes I don't want to, but I've got to. I pick it up and I read. I've got to pray, and sometimes I don't feel like praying, but I do pray, and when I get in the presence of God and pray, things happen and shift and change. I get out of bed and I come on a Sunday, and some Sundays I don't even feel like coming, and I'm the pastor, but I don't want to be here. I'd rather be doing something else, you know? But you turn up and you gather with God's people and God speaks to you and things happen and move and shift. We play a role in our own growth. Can you whack that back up for me again? Is that possible? We play a role in our own growth. Take another step back. Forgiveness without repentance. Do I need to say any more? Forgiveness without repentance. Forgiveness has become a prayer. Forgiveness is not a prayer, people. It's an action. It's a 180, it's a turning, it's a change of mind that leads to a change of action. Don't keep going back and telling God you're sorry about something if you're already planning to do it again. That's not repentance. Repentance is turning and walking away. We go back another step, Christianity without Christ. We live in a culture in the West, especially here in Australia. We want the fruits of your faith. We want you to care for the poor. We want you to look after the sick. We want you to take care of orphans and widows, but we don't want Jesus. We don't want Christ. We want the fruit of your faith. We don't want the reason you have that faith. Come and do all the good stuff, but don't talk about Jesus, please. We don't want to hear about him, but we want all the stuff that he's transformed your life. We want the good stuff that he's put in you, that he's turned you into. We want you to be like Jesus, but don't tell us about Jesus. That's the world we live in right now. And here's the thing. It all starts with the first one, religion without the Holy Spirit. I don't even realise Whether he meant to prophesy this, I don't even realize whether he thought there was a sequence to that. But when I look at that, I go, that's the very start of it. That's the beginning of the spiral down is you get religion without the Holy Spirit and the rest of it just starts falling like dominoes. Religion without the Holy Spirit. Religion without the Holy Spirit. Just being Christian. Trying to be good. Trying to make a difference all in our own strength. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. If you're comfortable, just close your eyes for one second. I want to tell you, I want to ask you a question. I want you to imagine that you are in a village somewhere in Israel and all of a sudden there's these murmurs about this guy called Jesus, this carpenter's son. He's healing people. He's casting out demons. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you've witnessed it with your own eyes. If not, you've certainly heard about it because people are chattering and murmuring. And there's this undercurrent of conversation. Wow, this is, this is amazing. This could be the one. God is doing something in our day. God is doing something in our age. That guy that was bound, that was howling at the moon, held up by chains and so on, that couldn't come into town. Remember him? Man, I went down there. I saw him. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus with a comb over and he's in his good mind. He's got a collar on and a tie. And now he's walking around telling everyone about Jesus. Imagine you're there. Imagine that you you see him give himself up with all this power, but then all of a sudden he almost submits himself to the cruel punishment of the cross, hands himself over to the Romans. You see him walking down that street carrying that cross with that beaten up, battered body. 
You see him up on a cross, nailed to a cross. You see the compassion. You hear him turn to one of the thieves and go, you're going to be with me today. You see the crowd's reaction, those that he's healed, set free, delivered. You see them weeping and wailing and wondering what's going on. Three days later, you hear this rumour. Apparently somebody saw him. He's supposed to be alive. And then somebody else says, well, we shouldn't be overly surprised. Remember, he said that. He actually said that he was going to come back. Do you remember that? And then you hear another rumour. Then another person says it. Then another person says it. Then all of a sudden, way back in the center of Jerusalem, there are a bunch of people gathering and they're praying and they're praying and they're praying. And then the Holy Spirit falls. And when that Spirit falls, these people come out and they start speaking in all these other languages and people are hearing them and you're going, wow, this is amazing. This is weird. I'm hearing that person speak in my language, but they don't speak my language, but I'm hearing it in my language. And then they get up and they preach and this conviction cuts and you look around as thousands of people scream out to Peter, what must I do? And then, and then it just sort of trickles out from there. Then there's a guy at the temple gate called Beautiful. He gets healed. Then another healing and another healing. And this is what's going on in the world around you. Do you think that in that moment you're now living with an awareness of the power of God? Do you think that when you face your next problem, you might start to ask the question, I wonder if Jesus could whatever. That's the environment of, the, of what we read about the birthing of the church. It was an environment with expectation and faith. That God was not a philosophy. God was not a theory. God could do things that we couldn't. That the supernatural, spiritual dimensions of life were very, very real. And that they could come to bear and put pressure on and transform and change what's happening here in this natural see, taste, touch, feel, smell world. It was possible because of God. It was possible because of God. All things are possible. God could do things that could change this world that we live in. Let me ask you another question. Are spiritual realities exactly that? Are they realities to you? Are they realities to you? See, that that culture I just described to you, that place I just took you to, that's not the place that you're living in right now. We're not not seeing that and experiencing and hearing all that stuff all the time. We're living in such a secular culture. We're living in such a here and now culture. We are living in in a a place where that kind of stuff is all theory and, 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 you know, was probably happened once. but, But, you know, that's... It's religion without the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. With no expectation of God's power and his presence to break into our world and do something. Of God's power and presence to flow through our life and do something. If you are sick, are you aware that there is a God who could heal you? Are you aware of healing power? If you're bound, are you aware that there is delivering power right here in this room on this earth today? If you're trapped, are you aware of power that can open prison doors? Are you aware of that? There's power that can open your prison doors. If you're blind, are you aware of a power that can open your eyes? If you're oppressed, are you aware of a power that can set you free? Are you aware of it? Do we live with that awareness? Are we aware of that? While we're at this conference, while we're at this conference, can I get, um, Christy, do you want to jump up on the keys for me? It's really funny. Someone came in this week. And I, I don't know if any of you know, I always put, the, I set up the chairs about here, right? So you're nice and close. Somebody came in this week and set them right back. Maybe they were expecting God to do something. Maybe they were thinking that people are going to come out today, we're going to pray, and maybe we're going to have a, 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 a bit of a move of the Spirit ourselves. I don't know, but whoever did the chairs, praise God, you were hearing from God. Thank you. I don't know who it was this week. Praise God. Awesome. In a minute, I'm going to invite people to come forward, and we want to pray. We want to pray for people. We want to pray. We want to petition God. We want to start believing God again for things. There was a five-year-old girl, we were at the conference, and this was on the, on the I think it was the Friday maybe, the last day, was it, or the first day? The first night, Wednesday night. And we're all in this conference, and we're worshipping God, and it was amazing, the worship was great. And there's a five-year-old kid, there's a house at the back behind the church, a fence and a house, and there was a, a five-year-old kid in the backyard who starts singing out worship songs and everything, and the mother comes running out, going, what are you doing? And the kid points to the top of the church building we were in, she says, can't you see him? She said, who? She said, that's Jesus. Jesus is on top of that building. 
Jesus is on top of that building. Well, the next day, the mother comes around and walks in and through a series of events, bumps into one of the ushers and the usher has the conversation with her. Well, yeah, you know, what are you hearing? And she tells the story. He goes, well, I actually live over the back there and, and my daughter was out in the back. And she starts singing, like worship type stuff, like you guys do. And, 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 and she's pointing, going, Jesus is on the roof of the building. Jesus is on the roof of the building. Jesus was there. She was aware. Here's this little girl who to our knowledge was not a Christian, who's aware of the presence of Jesus on that building. She was aware. And here's what I thought. I wonder whether that night when I was in there, while I was worshipping in that building, was I aware that he was there? Or was I just sort of going through my emotions because you worship at a conference. We all know that. You come to church on Sunday, you worship. It's what we do. Someone stands up and reads out of a book. It's what we do. And I ask myself the question, was I aware? I'm standing in this building worshipping and this little girl above my head is seeing Jesus on top of the building. Little five-year-old kid, you can't make that stuff up. And mother comes in the next day and I'm sure while she sat there would have heard the gospel and I don't know what happened from there, I just know that this little girl saw Jesus on the building. There's only one thing that has the potential to stop the power of God from moving in a community. It's only one thing. It's not the devil. It's not the culture. It's not pronouns. It's not gay marriage. All the things that we like to bug our fingers at and think, oh, the culture is so oppressive and we're losing. We're, we're not losing. We're not losing. The only thing I can find that has the potential to stop the power of God is a lack of faith and expectancy in the people who know Jesus. Mark chapter 6. Don't worry about going there. Let me sum it up for you. Jesus went to his own country. It says he went to his own relatives and he went to his own house. And there was no faith there. His country, his relatives, his house, his people. But there was no faith there. And in that moment, it says he could do anything. The people that knew Jesus didn't really know Jesus. Sounds a lot like the churches in that phone call that were closing down, I wonder. I wonder. I was in India once and there was a guy and he was preaching and I'll finish with this. And then I want to, I want to pray. If you've got to go, you can go. You know the drill here, but I want to hang around and pray. I was in India once and there was a guy, a Canadian evangelist, and he came. And I love the Indian people. I want you to know that with all my heart, just as I'm sure you love each other and you love your church. I love the Indian people and I loved being there. And I remember this Canadian evangelist, we hosted him. He came into our city of Nagpur and there were, there were thousands, 10,000 people packing the stadium every night for a week as this guy stood up and preached the gospel and then prayed for the sick and so on. And here's what he would say every night. If you're sick, come to Jesus. He will heal you. <laughs> If you got the, come up the front, we're going to pray for you. And it's, he just said, it's going to happen. And you know what? I was okay with it for a little bit. But then after a couple of nights, I noticed a little lady that had already walked 10 k's to be here, walk up the front, get prayed for, turn around and walk away the same. And then I noticed the next night, that's the same lady and she's back. and She's still not standing straight, getting prayed for. And she walked back and nothing happened. And then she came back the next night and, and I started to get really angry. And I remember one night, so clear as a bell, I jumped on my motorbike. And I'm just flying through these little laneways, the back streets of, of Nagpur. And I'm going off at God. How dare he come here and say that? What about all those disappointed people that aren't getting healed, God? What about all those people and he's making promises and he can't back it up, blah, blah, blah. And here's what the Lord said to me. He said, Alan, he said, you're right. Some people are going to get healed and some people aren't. He said, yeah, that's true. And then he said to me, but what do you think is going to happen if he stands up tonight and he says, hey, come forward if you're sick. Some of you are going to get healed and some of you aren't. He said, what category do you think most people will put themselves in? I said, well, if it was me, I'd probably jump in the category if it's not going to happen for me. And then he said this to me. He said, that's right. And then what faith do I have to work with? If there's no expectation, if there's no faith... See, here's the thing. If we build our lives on the basis of what we think God won't do, instead of building it on what God could do, 
we will never see what God wants to do. If we build our lives on the basis of what we think God won't do, instead of building it on what God could do, we'll never see what God wants to do. And I feel like maybe we've, we've got to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of building our lives on the basis of what we think God won't do. Because I see way too many people doing it. I do it. I build my life on what I think God won't do instead of building it on what God could do because if I build it on what I think God could do, I give him the best opportunity to do whatever he wants in the moment. And so we're going to start making room. Every Sunday we're going to do this now. I just feel like we have to do it. We went to this conference as a leadership and we were all challenged and each night we would chat about different things. And, and you know what? We need to go back. We, in the early days, who was around Arise in the early days? We would pray for people nearly every Sunday. There was faith in the room. There was expectation. Uh, we went from the GSAC. We grew. We moved into here. We started growing. But there almost seemed this moment where, if I'm honest, it almost felt like we settled into this complacent, uh, 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 what do you call it? You know, with the planes, they can't land and they just fly. What do you call that? And they just fl- Holding pattern. It's almost like, like, like we allowed ourselves to fall into a holding pattern. And I, I, I just really feel like God's saying, you know what, we've got to break out of that holding pattern. We've got to start believing again. And you know what? Look, if it doesn't happen for me today, I'm going to believe tomorrow. And if it doesn't happen tomorrow, I'm going to believe the next day. And if it doesn't happen the next day, I'm going to believe the next day. I'm just going to keep believing that God, is, God can do things. I'm just going to keep believing that it's possible for God. Because if I keep living in light of what I think God can do, then maybe I'm going to create an environment where if God wants to, He can. But if I build my life on the basis of what I think God won't do, where's the faith? Where is that stuff that He can work with? There's nothing there. So we're going to start praying each week. We're going to make room. Because I believe that God wants to save some people. I believe there are people, uh, there could be people here right now and you do not have a relationship with Jesus. You do not know Jesus. You know about God. You've got a head full of theories. Maybe you're brought up around God and the the Jesus stuff. But in your heart, you know there's no life and there's no relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that's you, I want this place to be a place where you are challenged to step into God and to grab a hold of that relationship and to begin that journey with Him. Close your eyes for a second right now. Just close your eyes. If there's anybody here right now and you do not have a relationship with Jesus, you know about God, but you've never given your life to Him. You've never opened your heart to His reality. You've never made the decision that, you know what, I've got plans for my life and purposes for my life. And this is, but, but you know what, there's going to come a point where one day you're going to have to make a decision. Are you going to surrender all that to God and take this journey with Him in the direction He wants to go to become who He wants you to become and do what He wants you to do? I'm only going to ask once this morning, if you're here this morning and that's you and you've never given your life to Jesus, just, I'm not going to embarrass you, I'm not going to call you up the front, just put your hand in the air. It's just a sign of faith before God. That today you're going to draw a line in the sand and you are going to start that journey with Jesus. It's fine. We're going to make room every Sunday for healing. If you're sick and you've got stuff going on in your body, we're going to ask you, come up, we want to pray. We want to stand in faith with you and we want to believe. You know, John Wimber, when he started the Vineyard Movement, you know, they, they, one, one Sunday he read that the believers will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And so he said to the, his congregation, come up, we're going to pray for you. Why? Just the Bible says, no goosebump, nothing. It just it says it, so we're going to do what it says. So he called them up, he prayed for them, and nothing happened. The next Sunday did the same thing, nothing happened. Next Sunday, same thing, nothing happened. Did it for about a year. Then one day a lady came forward and they prayed for her and she got healed. And then the next week another couple, and another couple. And before you know it, Uh, I don't have to tell you the story of the vineyard in the early days and there were signs, wonders and miracles because they just persisted in doing what God said to do and they kept stepping out so we're going to start making room for healing we're going to make room for deliverance there are people here and you've got stuff going on in your world and the truth is that the enemy is playing havoc with your life the devil is binding you up he's binding you up and I'm so sick to death of talking to people and being told the only way out of that is to take medication I'm tired of it, it's not true It's not true. I'm not a doctor and I'm not saying don't take medication and I'm not saying there's a place for medication. What I'm saying is you can't medicate the devil out of your life. You can't meditate a spiritual bondage off you. And we want to make room to pray for those people because God is real and the power of God is real and the presence of God is real and God wants to do way more than we are letting him do at the moment. And if he can't do it in our hearts, he can't do it through us. And he wants to do it through us. 
It's not about us. It's like Paul said, I came, I didn't preach with wise and persuasive words of human wisdom. I came in demonstration of the spirit and of power because I know that your faith needs to rest in what God can do, not what I can do. Because you're going to get up and I'm going to travel to another village. You're going to move to another town. You're going to have pressure and stuff come against you. And I'm not going to be there to preach another scintillating message to you. And you've got to hang on to God. So you need to encounter the power of God. And we're going to make room on Sundays for that. We're going to make room for the Holy Spirit to move and to do what he wants to do. Because we want to build our eyes on what God can do. Because it's the only way to make room for what God wants to do. Amen. So we're just going to, uh, Chrissy's just going to play. If you want to go, you can go. There's tea and coffee next door. But I, I just want to challenge everybody here this morning. For me personally, I kind of feel like for me, this week has been a line in the sand moment. There, there have been moments in my faith, in my journey of 30 years walking with the Lord, where I've known there's something significant about this season. And God's challenging me, going, Alan, this is a line in the sand moment. What side do you want to be on? And I've had to make decisions and step out in faith and step across lines and go, okay, God, like that old song. Remember that song? I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. I've made a, a moment, a declaration, a line in the sand. I won't turn back. I'm going in this direction. You can all walk that way if you want, but I'm going going this way and I've had moments like that and I feel like we're in that season right now I feel like we are in a season right now where God is challenging us I know he's challenging me draw that line no turning back make room for me make room for me trust me keep coming to me and come to me and come to me and come to me and come to me and build your life on what I can do stop building it on what you think I won't do because if you build it on what I can do, you're going to give me every chance to do what I want to do. If that's you, we want to pray for you this morning. I just want you to come out the front and I worry about what other people think. So, I don't know. You know, two weeks ago when, 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 when um, Ross was here and he, gave, he, he invited people to come up, you know what happened? About two people came up. And then some people in the congregation went up to people and said, hey, would you... Are you feeling God speaking to you? Why don't you go on up? You know what happened? At least three people came up that weren't up in the first place. And you know what happened? They got a word from God that day, had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Because somebody challenged them and said, Hey, is God speaking to you? Should you be up there? I don't know why we do it, but we just hold back. We're worried about what people think. We're worried about what we might think of ourselves. We're worried about what it communicates to people. Just communicates you're hungry. Communicates you're dependent. That's all it. I want to be that person anyway. I'm just going to pray. You guys lead us in some worship. As I said, if you need to go, you can, but just let me pray for us. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. I want to thank you, God, for your word. I want to thank you for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I believe, uh, God, you're here right now with us, Lord. And God, I know that you're speaking to people. I know that you are. And I know there are things going on inside people and reasons. Uh, God, there are uh, barriers and things, God, that they're fighting and wrestling. And I just bind those thoughts right now in Jesus' name. Silence those voices in the name of Jesus. And pray for those people. Let them hear clearly what the Spirit is saying to them right now. Father, we know that we are just a bunch of people. Without your Spirit, we will not make a dint in this community. We will not make an iota of difference in this community with our intellect, with our natural skill sets. We won't make a difference without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so I pray right now in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, let your power and your presence fill every person, touch every person in this place, God. Draw near to Him and He will draw near to you. And God, those people that you're drawing that line in the sand this morning, you're challenging them to cross over. God, give them the boldness and the courage, God, to get to that place where they go, you know what, I just don't care anymore what everybody else thinks. I don't care. I've got X amount of years left in me and I'm giving them to Jesus. I'm giving them to the building of his kingdom. I'm giving them to the proclamation of the good news. I'm giving them to binding, to, to setting at liberty those who are captive. I'm giving them 
to preach and recovery of sight to the blind. I'm giving them to you, God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name.